believe in yourself and your power. Um, and that's a very simple thing to say, but I'm always surprised at those who don't understand their power and haven't been supported in understanding that power. Welcome to the One Girl Revolution podcast. It's your girl, Kate, here. This is the place to find inspiring stories of world-changing women and girls every single week. So make sure that you subscribe to the One Girl Revolution podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and everywhere you listen to podcasts to make sure that you don't miss a single episode. Check out our website at onegirlrevolution.com. That's the number one, girlrevolution.com, to find all of our podcast episodes, watch our Emmy-nominated documentaries, donate to our nonprofit organization to help us continue our critical work to elevate women's voices and their stories, and so much more. Go to onegirlrevolution.com. That's the number onegirlrevolution.com today. On this week's episode of the One Girl Revolution podcast, I welcome Katherine Snyder, CEO of Good Plus Foundation. Good Plus Foundation was founded by Jessica Seinfeld, an incredible powerhouse of a woman who is changing the world. Many of you may know her husband, Jerry Seinfeld, so that's probably why her name sounds familiar to you. Jessica founded this organization originally to address the basic needs of mothers and their children. And the organization has grown and evolved to become a leading national nonprofit working to dismantle multi-generational poverty by pairing tangible goods with innovative services for low-income fathers, mothers, and caregivers, creating an upward trajectory for the whole family. Absolutely incredible. In 2010, Good Plus Foundation expanded their programming to intentionally include fathers. Stronger fathers build stronger, more resilient families, which are the backbone of thriving communities. The more they have invested in fathers and their capacity to be engaged co-parents, the greater impact they see, we see on children and families as a whole in our society. Good Plus Foundation's goal is to incentivize parental enrollment and participation in programs like counseling, health services, employment assistance, financial literacy, co-parenting classes, and so much more. Catherine and Good Plus Foundation are doing incredible work to dismantle multi-generational poverty throughout our country. You are going to love this episode. You're going to love Catherine and you're going to love Good Plus Foundation. Here's my conversation with Catherine. Catherine, welcome to the One Girl Revolution podcast. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. So I have been following the Good Plus Foundation for a long time, and I'm really excited to have you on to share a little bit about the work that you're doing and how people can get involved and how they can support the great work that you're doing. But before we get into that, I would love to rewind and hear a little bit about you and a little bit about your own story before you got involved in the Good Plus Foundation. So can you tell me a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and just a little about your story? Sure. Um, I am the mom of two boys, um, wife to my husband, George Schwimmer. I've lived in New York for 28 or 29 years now, but I'm originally from Montreal, Quebec. Um, and I say that because in some ways, I think that it informs and shapes the work that I do. You know, we I grew up in a social democracy where we had excellent health care and other strong social service supports. So I think when I first moved to this country, um, I was surprised that some, you know, some of the, the social support systems weren't in place. Um, but I, after graduating from University of Virginia, I moved to DC. I was interested in politics, um, interned at the Canadian consulate. I found the work interesting, but realized very quickly that that life was not for me. I think I wanted to be doing something a little bit more active diplomacies needed and very important, but I was just very interested in getting more involved with an issue and moved to New York. And, you know, I think I was very struck by what a wonderful city it is, how diverse it is, but yet there's tremendous disparity. Um, so I started out working on the Lower East Side many years ago, working for the Tenement Museum I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a museum that has a social mission to promote tolerance and really teach the story of both immigrants past and present and really drawing a bridge between those two communities. 
And it's not only a phenomenal museum, it's a really amazing place that I implore anyone to, to go and visit. Um, but it also does very active work in the community. So the Lower East Side is still a, a vibrant immigrant community. And we were doing work with um, teaching immigrants through the diaries of letters and, um, and words of immigrants past, teaching English. We were involved in community activism and getting different groups to kind of own their own history and um, worked with them on advocacy around historic preservation, whether it was a synagogue or a Chinese temple. Um, so very interesting work. And what we ended up doing, because I was the VP of Public Affairs for the Tenement Museum, I would get calls from folks around the world saying, this is a very cool museum, a very historic site. And yet you have this activist approach to history. How do you do what you're doing? And through that, I said, hey, there's a there there. There's a movement here. And so we created something called the Coalition of Site Museums of Conscience, which was a global coalition to look at using history in an activist way. Eventually through that, I made connections with the Rockefeller Foundation, moved over there. Um, and I worked at the Rockefeller Foundation on a couple of different portfolios that were very diverse and very interesting. One of which was giving conditional cash transfers in New York City to families living on low incomes. And I'm saying that because I'll tee it up for something I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later possibly. Um, but I was there for a couple of years doing work in Uganda and had this interesting aha moment where I had a two-year-old and a three-year-old at home. I missed them terribly. And I was away in Africa for two weeks and I was focused on the children in these slums because I was missing my own children. And then started thinking and said, you know, there's tremendous need in New York City. Why am I not focusing my efforts in my own home city um, where my children and family are? This is something I need to do. And so eventually kind of came to Good Plus Foundation, which was then called Baby Buggy. And I knew it because I had been a donor to the organization, thought very highly of Jessica's work and, and the structure. And it was just kind of this perfect fit um, and transition for me in terms of my talents and skill sets. So that was almost 15 years ago. So it feels like a lifetime now. You have seen Good Plus Foundation through so many different chapters, I know. And there are so many different stories and facets that I want to talk about. But yeah, I want to talk about the story of Jessica and how she started this organization, which is now known as Good Plus Foundation. Can you share that story, what you know of, of her sure. founding this organization? Sure. It's an amazing story. You know, she is the daughter of a social worker. Her mom worked in the prison system in Vermont for 30 years, a wonderful woman um, who just celebrated a birthday. Um, but Jessica, because she grew up with her two sisters in this kind of activist household herself, she had always been very involved in social issues. And in fact, when she was um, an undergraduate at University of Vermont, she worked in the parole office and she had her own she was an intern and she had her own kind of client case. And these were women, many of whom were criminally justice involved because they were moms and they were stealing diapers because they couldn't afford diapers for their children. And so she had that background and experience. Then fast forward to when she had her own children, you know, it's, it's similar to my experience said, hey, this is, you know, I'm having kids and I'm able to afford everything these children need. What does a, a family do who doesn't have my resources? I know full well what those stresses look like based on my own experience. I need to do something. And so her sister was working at the Robin Hood Foundation at the time, and they, they really did their due diligence and said, is there a need for an organization that can provide strollers and high chairs and cribs and all these expensive items that can be out of reach for families? They went to their grantee partners and one after another came back with a resounding yes. You know, and the report was either our social workers are coming back and saying, parents are putting children in a box or a drawer because they can't afford a crib or the social worker who doesn't make much money themselves, you know, it's putting, um, kind of outlaying the money for these items. And so with that information, they realized there was a there there and created what was then called baby buggy. Um, and it was really a family effort with, you know, Jerry and all of their community kind of coming together. Cause I think everyone just realized this was such a novel, brilliant idea. There's such a need for these very basic things in our world. And I love that you shared that part of the story where they looked around and they asked 
questions of other organizations to make sure that they weren't recreating the wheel, yes. right? Because people get ideas for organizations yes. or companies, and sometimes they're just like recreating the wheel when it's like, okay, can I actually just support something that's already there? But it wasn't there. And so they are filling a need. And I know that Good Plus Foundation has has grown and evolved to cover so many different needs to expand from what it was started as. What yeah. was that point where it turned from, from the original organization into Good Plus Foundation? Well, it was interesting. I started in September of 2008. And I don't know if you recall, but... <laughs> The market was crashing. So I'd left the Rockefeller Foundation, go over to, to this new organization as deputy director. And the then executive director was about to go on a maternity leave. The market was crashing. Recession was looming. And it was this opportunity to say, let's really do a deep dive and, and figure out where we can have the most impact. And at the same time, let's kind of create a worst case scenario budget just because who knows what's going to happen with this market. Um, as well as knowing full well that a recession would impact these families who are already living at or below the poverty line. So it was a, a, it was a challenging but fortuitous opportunity for me to come in with sort of an outsider's perspective and say, let's do a deep dive into the data. Where, where can you have the most impact? And there were a couple of interesting pieces I mentioned before at the Rockefeller Foundation working on this conditional cash transfer program. I realized that the goods themselves were incredibly needed. We would never be able to meet all of the demand in New York City with over 500,000 children under the age of five living in poverty. You know, that's close to impossible for this one small organization. And started thinking about how we could have those, those items have an even greater value add. How could we use them as incentives to fill gaps? So starting to talk to very strong community-based programs that we're doing phenomenal work, but saying, where are the gaps in your service? And some of them were saying, you know, we're not seeing enough undocumented parents of citizen children because they're worried to come to the program, or we're not seeing enough single moms because how are they balancing work life and childcare and, and coming to programs? And so we started using, working with our partners to really use those donations to incentivize enrollment and retention. So one example is there was a phenomenal program in East Harlem that was screening families for benefits. They weren't seeing some single moms. They weren't seeing undocumented parents of citizen children. I said, hey, let's start giving them packs of diapers because everyone needs diapers. Um, and through that, so with flyers in the community, through that word of mouth, they were able to see a 300% increase in those two cohorts within six months. And then we took it a step further and said, okay, parents are coming in the door, how do you know that they're taking the next step and, and you know, enrolling in WIC and EBT and everything that they're screamed for and kind of that next step? And they said, well, it's difficult where families are transient and it's hard to track. And we said, okay, let's then promise parents if they come back for the second um, round of meetings with social workers that they will re receive a case of diapers. And through that, we were able to see these families were getting about $1,500 in annualized aid what that told us was that diapers and cribs and strollers could be a very powerful incentive. And so we started working with each one of our community-based partners to say, okay, let's make sure these donations have a greater value add. Let's use these to kind of bo boost enrollment or retention where you have gaps. So we, we still to this day work very closely with the partners to determine what those gaps are and think about how those goods can really have that value add. And today, what is your model? I know that it's grown and evolved yeah. and you serve so many different people. What is the model of Good Plus Foundation and who do you serve? Sure. So I think of our work um, still kind of on two pillars. So one, we've got those goods, the essential items that we know these families need. I always, you know, give someone a, an interesting data point. It's about a hour and a half of minimum wage should be able to afford a pack of diapers. So forget rent, forget groceries, everything else you need. That's extraordinary. So we continue to provide basic needs to families enrolled in the social services of our community-based partners. And we've got about 110 different partners. These are families, um, largely families of color. So in, in Los Angeles, they're largely Latino, Latinx families. In New York, there's a larger proportion of Black African-American families, but mostly families of color, largely living at or below the poverty line. 
And so in order to get those goods, families have to enroll in those classes. So the ESOL classes, the financial literacy programs, the co-parenting classes. So the idea is that we're getting items that they need um, for their immediate health and safety of their children. Well, parents are also providing that or getting that wraparound support to help build the upward trajectory for the family as a whole. So sort of kind of short term, long term support. In addition, in recent years, we've also led on cash assistance. So we know that it's not enough just to give families goods if they don't have the cash they have to be, need to have the flexibility to you know, cover rent in a time of rising rents or to purchase groceries at a time when we're seeing um, food insecurity on the rise. And so in addition to goods, they're also getting micro grants through Good Plus Foundation. I'm proud to say we've now provided close to a million dollars over the last three years. And again, for families, you know, who are living at or below the poverty line, that 200 to $250 grant is very important. The second piece of our work is a little bit newer. And that's because after years of, you know, really refining that model, which is phenomenal and impactful, we took a step back and said, look, we're giving families the items that they need immediately. We're helping to kind of build the long-term trajectory, but then they're going back into systems that are failing and systems that are keeping them at the poverty line or below. And we can't just keep giving out these goods without addressing the root cause of poverty. And so in recent years, we've been doing a lot more work with advocacy at the systems level. So whether it's talking about diaper need at you know, state legislatures or Jessica is going to Washington DC next week to meet with the dad's caucus, to talk about father engagement, to then also training social workers and people on the front line on these various issues. So we're, our Good Plus Training Academy is training social workers, judges, teachers on everything from how you engage dads within the social service sector, because it's not something that's generally taught in social work school, to how do you address implicit bias? Um, you know, so many social workers were coming to us and saying, look, I know kids are going in the foster care system because we're not doing enough to engage the dads or think about what's happening at the family level. And yet we don't, no one's ever trained us on how to do this work in a different way. Um, so it's very important to us to make sure that we have those interventions with the systems that are holding families back. It's really innovative what you're doing, because like you mentioned, a lot of times people, and I've done a lot of work with uh, women in, who are incarcerated or formerly mm. incarcerated yes. and how a lot of times they're almost on this trajectory where they keep going back, keep going back, yep. keep going back because they can't get off the conveyor belt of the things that are happening in their lives. But now you have some organizations that are building a community around and saying, okay, let's ask the questions. What if X, Y, or Z was different? Yes. What yes. can we actually do to change that trajectory? And you're doing that with so many different people. It's incredible. And, and I will be clear, we're doing that through partnership and collaboration um, because that's very important to us. We're, you know, a relatively small organization, but yes, we're, we're aligning with like-minded people like you who know to ask those questions and say, what else is happening? What is the root cause? I told one of my colleagues the other day, I'm sick and tired of talking about diaper name. It's real, but I'm tired of talking about it. Let's focus on why these parents don't have a living wage. Let's focus on what, what systems are making this, you know, the case that we're now on thir three generations of families who don't have engaged dads and our systems are, are thinking about these families and are haven't evolved in how they're thinking about families. And it's important for all of us too. That's a big part of why this podcast exists yeah. is for all of us to think about what's going on in our community, right? What's Thank going you. on with our neighbors? What are things that we all can do? And just to be aware, right? To spread awareness. Agreed. And and there was a cool video that I saw on TikTok the other day of this girl and she would take $20 bills or $100 bills. I can't remember, but it was some significant amount of money. And she would go around to grocery stores and in diaper boxes, she would shove mm. cash into it. And I was like, that's such a simple thing. But she knew she was like, a lot of people are spending all the money that they have on diapers, yeah. which is just a necessity, right? And so yeah. she would shove cash in it. And I was like, that's a really cool thing. I want to start doing that. That's great. 
Watch In Tandem on One Girl Revolution's website or on our YouTube page. In Tandem is the inspiring story of Caitlin Cullen and her restaurant in Milwaukee, The Tandem. The Tandem does more than just serve food. The Tandem is a family, a community of support for everyone. The Tandem hires people that often no one else will hire, gives them an opportunity, trains them, and helps them find their way in this world. The Tandem is a support system for everyone who walks through their doors. But when COVID hit in March 2020, the Tandem story became even more inspiring. The Tandem closed their doors to customers and began solely feeding people in need during a time when so many people were struggling. Caitlin and the Tandem community fed over 115,000 people during the first year of the pandemic. Absolutely incredible. Watch and share in tandem today on our website at onegirlrevolution.com. I want to talk about the the great work that you're doing with fathers because you are just doing a lot. And I know that it kind of expanded in, in 2010 to start focusing on fathers. Can you talk about the father factor? Sure. Thank you. And it's interesting because again, talking about implicit bias, you know, I came from I did a lot of work around women and girls and and families and, you know, I'm a feminist and hadn't really thought about how our systems were only addressing women and children and why that could be detrimental. But going back to asking questions, as you said, and what's happening in our community, a lot of the way I approach these things is taking a look at the data. And so when we were taking a look at the families we were serving, you know, I was very interested to note that 64% of the families who received our goods were headed by single moms. And I said, okay, that's, that seems like a very high number. Let's take a look at the federal census and, and compare it to what's happening there. And it was much higher than the families, number of families living in poverty who are headed by single moms, but even that was a significant number. And so it started this question of well, what's happening with the dads? Where are the dads, you know, Clearly there are dads, so how are we engaging them? How are we not engaging them? What work is happening with them? What are some of the challenges? We started investing in a couple of interesting fatherhood programs. And I will tell you, I was kind of gobsmacked by the response we were getting. So we were giving the diapers and strollers and high chairs and everything that we had traditionally given the moms. And we were getting this very interesting anecdotal information. And fascinating stuff and said, okay, we need to bring in an independent evaluator to really do a deeper dive and look at the impact on these dads, what's happening with dads, what's happening with the moms once these dads are bringing these items to the table, um, and then what's happening with our program partners. What we saw is that once dads who are living on low incomes, these are largely non-custodial dads, so they're not living in the home, they don't have full custody, sometimes they don't even have shared custody, but as soon as they had a pack of diapers, a coat, a baby carrier to provide the mom or the child, over 80% said that they felt more like a dad to their child. So we saw this interesting kind of shift in behavior and, and thinking with the dads. Then over 85% said that the relationship with the child's mother was improving. And when we did a deeper dive, you know, these moms, all of a sudden, if the, the child's father was able to bring something to the table, they had more relief. Then they allowed the dad to spend more time with the child. So all of a sudden, he was, he was more of a co-parent to the child. And then what we saw is our program partner said, yes, you know, these can be very proud men. Many of them talked about machismo and, you know, they might be hesitant to come and ask for help. But as soon as they were getting these items, they were coming back. They were talking to me more. They were sharing more about the challenges that they were having as, as parents. And so given that information, we said we have to do more with this. We were challenged because there weren't enough fatherhood programs out there. So our system squarely focused on that mother-child dyad. And what we eventually realized was, well, we understand how that happened that actually put an extra burden on moms because it was saying, Hey, it's going to, you're the only person who can really support this child. It was sidelining dads. And then there is so much data out there that just shows the benefits of father engagement in the child's life. So we know when a child doesn't have an engaged father, they, you know, perform um, their performance in school drops off. Truancy rates are higher, higher rates of incarceration, you know, worse rates of social economic development, 
there was a study by a Harvard economist who talked about the presence of dads in a community and how that impacts economic mobility. So with that information, we said, we can't stop here. And so we turned the table on our grantee partners and said, we want to see you all be father inclusive. And that's where our training academy came in, where we really supported them to do that because social workers were saying, I want to engage dads, but I don't know how to do that when there's a, a difficult relationship between the mother and dad. Or I don't know what, how to do that when, you know, we don't have programs that are specifically designed for dads. So it's been a long evolution, but what we've really realized is the father factor is critical. It's a key poverty trap in this country. And despite a wealth of data on what father engagement does to benefit a child, to benefit a community, we've done very little to kind of address that issue. I've read so many stories or articles about how important fathers are, but tangibly, what do fathers need to do? And, and that's another place where you're really answering that question. Here are some opportunities for dads to really step in and building community between children and their fathers is so important. And like you said, you know, when you start, when they start doing these little things like getting a pack of diapers, it can build yeah. community even between the parents, which is so important. Yes. Yeah, we and so many of our dads, you know, sitting in on those fatherhood programs in their early days. I remember this one point when it was the Bronx fatherhood program. There were 20 men in the room and the facilitator said, what have prepared you? What would have prepared you to be a father? And 19 of the men said a dad because they didn't have dads themselves. And one said, my dad was extremely abusive. So I just had a terrible role model. And so it was so interesting to unpack this data. And again, you know, we're now on the third generation of families who look very different without fathers living in the home, but saying, okay, just because they're living outside the home doesn't mean they can't be successful co-parents. And so a lot of the work is focused on healthy relationships and co-parenting and saying, we understand the two of you, you parents are not best friends and you might not be in a relationship but how do you come together to really figure out what is best for your child? And that's been astounding and amazing to see. It's incredible to think about the power that parents each individually have mm -hmm. too with children. And we see yes. that in incarceration. We see that in homelessness, um, people experiencing homelessness, how the power of even one parent, but even more so with both parents, if they're both on the same page, that they yeah. can not only change the trajectory of their lives and their families' lives, but they can change the trajectory of their children's lives, which you've yes. touched on a couple of different times. It's amazing. Yeah, I think that's when we think about where we're most successful with interventions, especially with dads, it tends to be new or expecting dads. So they're the most vulnerable, they're nervous, but they're also the most receptive for help and, and information. And they're kind of excited. And so to work with them at that point is very exciting. And then dads who have been formerly incarcerating, who are coming out on the outside and saying, I don't want the same for my kid. I want to change his or her trajectory. And so that's why I'm back and engaged and, and please help me do that. Um, but yes, I mean, parents can have an incredible role in changing that trajectory. And, and that's part of our mission statement is talking about how do we give parents the tools um, so that they can create that upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. That's it's incredible. It's incredible what you're doing, Catherine. So you've been a part of Good Plus Foundation for many years now. Um, yes. And I know that you've heard so many stories, you have had interactions with so many different people, but is there a story or two of people that have been impacted in a positive way through Good Plus Foundation that you could share? Sure. And there, and there are too many, um, but there's one that I always think is kind of top of mind. And again, when I think about the evolution with the fatherhood work, this one was key. I think what most people in this country don't realize is that the majority of children who are in the foster care system are there because or in, involved with child welfare because their parents are deemed to be what's called it neglectful. It's not abuse. It's neglect. And neglect can even mean that if a parent doesn't have a crib for the baby to sleep in, or if a parent can't provide tight diapers, a child can be removed from their custody. So that is a horrifying thing to think about. And that's one of the reasons why we're working with child welfare. And when you 
so you think about that on the macro level, and here's a very specific story that just kind of hit me in the face. We had one of our fatherhood programs in Los Angeles reach out and say, we have a young dad who is really struggling. He just joined our program. We're working with him on job support, job training. You know, he doesn't have his GED. He's very close. We're going to work with him on that. In the meantime, we're getting him all the things he needs to be able to provide for his child because, so here was a a dad, he was married, he was not married to the the mother of his child. The mother of his child had drug issues and eventually the two of them split. He was an 18 year old father who didn't have a dad himself, had very little family in the Los Angeles area, but really cared for his child and wanted to do right by his child. He was taking his child to daycare so that he could go off and and earn money. Of course, again, not a living wage, but earn money. Um, And because he was, things were tough, he started making his own homemade cloth diapers and bringing the child to daycare in these kind of makeshift diapers with safety pins because that's all he could afford. Unfortunately, the child care system or the child care worker called ACS on him was reported and his child was removed from his custody. So simply because he couldn't afford disposable diapers, his child was put into the foster care system. It happens time and time again. This is not the only story I've heard. There have been many other stories. And so here was this single dad who has a child ripped from his care and had to fight to get that child back. Luckily, it only it was only about two months, which is not bad when it comes to the system. Um, but he was able to reunite to the, with the child and we were able to provide all those items and he was able to get the support he needed. Um, but that's just one story that stands out because think about it, diapers. And I, and I remember with two kids going through diapers constantly, you know, your child grows and all of a sudden the, they don't, one pack doesn't fit them anymore but diapers totally changed this family's life. And we have so many people in this country that are living paycheck to paycheck. And there may be a week where they're like struggling just to buy a box of diapers and like, okay, let me just piecemeal whatever I can together. And, and just to get to the next paycheck, it's heartbreaking. And just what you shared there, that there isn't a system to support them. And so I'm grateful for all the, all the work that you're doing through good plus foundation you're dealing with a lot of really difficult issues. You know, you're hearing all these difficult stories like that one that you just shared. Catherine, what is it that fuels your fire to keep going? Maybe it's anger or frustration that the system is broken. <laughs> Some days, yeah. What is it? What is the, the spark within you that makes you keep going? Or maybe there are hard days too, I'm sure. Difficult days where you're like, I can't seem to, we can't help everybody. How do we do this? What is it that keeps you going? I think one, um, I think for me, it's a calling. It's not a job. It's, it's what I have to do and what I need to do. So it's, I don't have a choice in some way, which was just a strange thing to say, but I think that's how I was brought up. And, you know, my mom, um, was a teacher and my dad, a professor, my mom, just turned is turning 85, but she was a home visitor with St. Vincent de Paul up until about two months ago. And so I come from that background. I, that's the way I grew up and and that's the way I, I, you know, think about life. Um, But then the other side of it is, yeah, there's a little bit of anger and then sometimes that's a good thing because it drives you forward. But I also have an incredible team and great group of collaborators and we see impact every single day. So I think if we didn't see that, that would be frustrating. And and it's some of these stories would be too horrifying, but we experience it every single day. And so it's easy to keep fighting the fight when you know that there's, you know, you're turning a corner or you're seeing a family kind of on that upward tra- trajectory. Um, but it's, it's a great question. And it's, it's one I don't even ask. It's just, you know, again, fueled by my passion for the work and the mission. Yeah. And you're able to see, like you said, so many people that are being helped through your work. And and we, if we open our eyes to our own communities, we can see the needs there. I think a lot of times we just close our eyes or, you know, don't look at the difficulties other people around us are, are suffering with. But when we open our eyes, we can make such a big impact. Every person can make a difference. Yeah. So agreed. Donate to One Girl Revolution's nonprofit organization to help us continue our work. 
highlighting inspiring women and girls that are changing the world through their lives, promoting their work and their organizations, and building a powerful and positive force out in the world dedicated to empowering women, their voices, and their stories. Donate at onegirlrevolution.com backslash donate. That's the number one girlrevolution.com backslash donate. Catherine, where does Good Plus Foundation go from here in your dream of dream worlds five or 10 years down the line? What are some things that you're working on? What can you share? I think what's very interesting is that work in micro grants. Um, so I had done this work with conditional cash transfer programs at the Rockefeller Foundation, did a great deal of research. There's now 20 years of data, positive data around the globe on how cash transfer programs help. Um, and I think there is tremendous opportunity there on both sides of the aisle, which is interesting. I think there's a there's been, especially during COVID, people realize that um, it's really hard to get by on minimum wage. And while there are a lot of debates about raising the minimum wage, there are ways you can think about cash support systems to, and, and one of the most efficient ways but of providing aid to families living on low income. So I'm very excited about that. And we're continuing to scale up that program. We'll pilot it in two additional cities. So it's only been rolled out in Los Angeles and New York, and we're going to pilot in two additional cities this year. Um, and then there continues to be tremendous support, again, on both sides of the aisle, which is important in getting kind of forward movement and momentum on the father engagement work. So I think everyone agrees that children do better when a dad's involved in the child's life. I think there are certain systems that everyone agrees are not working. Child support is one of them. We actually wrote a toolkit with the Ascend Group at Aspen Institute to take a look at how we can reform child support. I think there are tremendous opportunities to think about basic needs and, and low-income families in a different way. For people that are listening that want to get involved in what you're doing, whether it's through donations or support your work in some way, what are all of the ways that people can get involved in Good Plus Foundation? Sure. I think, you know, one is helping us with those basic needs. So we have a wish list on our website and we we update that constantly. So we because we have the sophisticated inventory management system, we know day to day, week to week, what our families, those who receive our donations need. So whether it's breast pumps or diapers or you know winter coats during the winter time, or right now we're actually trying to get school supplies um, to fill the gap over the summer months. So that is a very important people, a way that people can support. And you know there are all sorts of range of items. And then, as you said before, thinking about what's happening in your own community and really asking the questions of what else can we do? Basic needs are critical and we know that those can potentially save the life of a child, but taking a step back and saying, what are, what are some of the systems that are holding these families back? And start asking questions of your local politicians and saying, okay, what are you really doing to support families on low incomes? There's a lot of talk about families living on middle incomes, and, and that makes sense, um, given constituents and voters, but we need to be asking questions more about families who are living at or below the poverty line. It's not a popular thing. You're not going to hear it a lot on political stumps, but voters can, can one vote, and they can also ask those questions and really think about how they can drive and they can write letters and they can think about how they can drive change at the community, state and federal level. And I'll encourage everybody to follow Good Plus Foundation on social media. Thank I always you. say that's that huge. that's the free and easy yeah. way to support anything. And I will be sure to put your website and your wish list Thank and everything you. else in the show notes so people can easily find it. And you shared some of the ways that people can emulate your work, right, at the local level. But I think yeah. it's important for people to even just open their eyes, like I said before, open their eyes. And if you see a family that might be struggling or you know somebody who yes. lost their job, go and buy them diapers and, you know, little things. There's so many, make a meal yeah. for them. There are so many little things that we can do in our own in our own communities. Yeah, food insecurity is huge right now. Um that's just an issue that we've seen on the rise. It, it's been bad for years, but certainly since the COVID days, it's just been on the rise. And then certainly we know rents um, and utilities are on the rise. So again, 
people are really struggling right now to be able to make ends meet in a way that they weren't even, you know, say four or five years ago. Yeah. And it's so, so simple for people to get involved. I actually have a couple of people in our community here at One Girl Revolution that have shared stories of somebody like at Christmas time, just paying their, their rent and not even asking the question, just knowing that they were struggling and just figuring out who their landlord was and paying their rent for a month so that they could, you know, buy their kids Christmas gifts and actually have a little money there. And there are so many little things that we can do. And even I think COVID taught us a lot that Amazon is, is such a gift when it comes to like surprising people with a package full of necessities. It's so easy. You don't even have to leave your house. You can just sit and sit there and do the Agreed. Amazon wish list to support the work that you're doing or surprise someone else in your community with, with a little gift box. Yeah. And if you, there are many national diaper bank network has a list of all the diaper banks around the country. We do a lot of work with them. There's some great work happening at the community level. And then certainly food banks are doing phenomenal work. So yes, there are many, we love it when people support good plus foundation, but there is, there is a lot of great work happening. Catherine, you are such a one girl revolution, and I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast to share your story Thank and you. to share Jessica Seinfeld's story and all about Good Plus Foundation. But who is a one girl revolution in your life? Who is a woman or girl that inspires you? Thank you for asking, and, and thank you for your great work. Um, you know, there I almost think there are too many to name. I feel like there's so many phenomenal women on the front lines who don't get enough recognition. I mentioned my mother before, Jessica Seinfeld's mother, you know, but then thinking about New York City, I think initially some of the folks who inspired me, Lillian Wald, who was a, at the forefront um, of work on the Lower East Side, to Shirley Chisholm, who was doing phenomenal work in New York City as the first Black representative. Um, and then people like you, who are really spreading the word. That's very, very important to for A lot of this, as you said before, can be very hard to hear. And I think it's important for us to share the stories of people who are impacted, but then also to take a step back and give them more context and say, okay, this is one microcosm, but let's take a look at what's happening at the macro level. And we as citizens play a part in what's happening there and what can we do about it. So thank you so much for sharing this information with this wider, phenomenal group of listeners and constituents. It's truly my honor. And I'm so excited for for people to hear this episode and get to hear about your story and the great work that you're doing. And I think that so many people, so many of us, we want to do good in the world, right? But we don't know how to start. And this podcast is also about, we don't all have to start an organization or a company There are so many great, amazing organizations like Good Plus Foundation that we can get involved in and just support, even like I said, in the small ways by following on social media and sharing different things that you're posting to encourage other people and spread awareness and and educate the public, honestly. Yeah, education is key. Um, and, And sharing that content is key. These are very complex issues. They're not easy by any means. And so, yes, I think for people to really kind of get, you know, get up to speed on what's happening and asking those questions, asking questions and listening. And, and as you said, you know, thinking about what's happening with their neighbors is key. Catherine, I am so grateful to have you on this podcast and I'm Thank just so grateful so for much. all it was of great the, to talk to you. the great work that you do. But before I let you go, I always end this podcast on one question. So I'd like to ask you, if you could leave women and girls around the world with one message, what would it be? believe in yourself and your power. Um, And that's a very simple thing to say, but I'm always surprised at those who don't understand their power and haven't been supported in understanding that power. Um, We all have it. And unfortunately, not everyone, you know, receives the encouragement that I did or you did or that they do from their community, but to, to really believe in your own power. I love that so much. And I'm a firm believer that we are each as unique as our fingerprint. And we have an impact, an imprint that we have to leave on this world. And we need to to own that and own that power. Yeah. And so thank you so much, Catherine, for being on the One Girl Revolution podcast. And thank you for all the incredible work that you do. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. 
Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at One Girl Revo. That's the number one girl R E V O. And you can find more information on One Girl Revolution at OneGirlRevolution.com. That's the number one girl revolution.com.